I read in 2018, we actually set a record. They recorded over 54,000 earthquakes just in that one year. But uh, you'll be glad to know that our uh, seismic center says that we actually only average a little over 1,000 a month, okay? <laughs> but uh, but we, don't, we don't feel all of those, thankfully, but uh, we remember many, don't we? We remember the ones that we, that we felt in particular uh, a couple of years ago, you know, and we lost up toward my house half of the road on, on numerous hills coming up to my house, the asphalt and everything just gone. But as unsettling as they are, and they are unsettling, isn't it true that very often we are shaken much more severely by the events that happen in our lives? And um, I know it's true for me, um, right, right in this very room a number of years ago, uh, my wife passed out here in the back of the room. She went into a, a, a very strong seizure, and that began a journey. She had multiple seizures uh, daily. Um, she'd feel them coming on. We're trying to catch her in the parking lot for, before she'd fall on the floor. And she had an MRI. She had a brain tumor. And we had to go out to Mayo Clinic, and uh, it was a very long and complicated surgery, six and a half hours, uh, bleeding on her brain for hours. And... Uh, and when she um, came out of that surgery, she was paralyzed on her left side. And our, our life at that moment was shaken, right? It was shaken. And I have prayed and wept with parents, some of them in this room, at the loss of a child. I have prayed and wept and done all that I could to comfort grieving widows, some in this room. I have done all that I can in so many difficult circumstances. The, the simple truth is that life is very often hard. It, it just is. And I'll give you a little bad news up front. You can't escape it. Um, if you live long enough, you're going to go through hard things. Okay, You're, you're going to face hard things that... You're just going to have to go through. And, you know, every person, it's true for you. Think of Jesus himself. First, he was betrayed by a close friend. I mean, not just anybody, but, but a close friend. And then when they arrested him, they, they lied about him. They slandered him. They abused him. Uh, they beat him in the face with their fists and with clubs. They scourged him with whips. They pushed a crown of thorns down on his head. They blindfolded him, and then they struck him in the, in the face again and again, saying, prophesy, who hit you, mocking him. And then they nailed him to a cross. They hung him up for all the world to see. And uh, believe me when I tell you that Jesus understands what it feels like to go through hard things. He's been where you are when you're in those places. He knows exactly how you feel when your life is shaken. Here's the beautiful thing. Jesus can bring life out of those dark places. Now, I'm not telling you that he's going to change all of the difficult circumstances in your life or that he's going to remove them from your life. It simply isn't true. Sometimes... Sometimes it's true. Thank you, Lord, for those times. But very often we have to walk through them. And if we are willing, He will work on our hearts to bring healing, to restore us, to bring us a new day with a fresh outlook and a fresh perspective. He will lift us out of those ashes if we're willing and the world says, how can that be? Because after all, if what you say is true, they carried his dead body down from a cross and they put it in a tomb, right? Well, here's what happened in Matthew chapter 28, verses 1 through 4. After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake. For an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. You know, when those guards got up that morning, it was just another day for them. 
And they had, you know, not only was their life shaken literally by an earthquake, but their life was shaken to the very core. I mean, they literally saw angels. You, you know, many people um, may in this lifetime encounter an angel because the Lord says, don't forget to entertain strangers because in so doing, some people have entertained angels without being aware of it. Sometimes they come in the form of a person. But to actually literally see an angel shining, okay, in, in, in the reflective glory of heaven, that's something that uh, not too many people get to see. But those guards did. And I wonder, okay, I wonder after the fact what their story was because they witnessed the angels, they witnessed the empty tomb. I wonder sometimes, will I meet them in heaven? Do you know, what happened to those Guys, because their lives were powerfully, powerfully moved on that day. Verse 5, the angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, he has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. You see, people have been looking for Jesus, but they're always looking among things that are dead. You're not going to find him in a tomb. You're not going to find him in a cemetery. You're not going to find him in a dead church. And you're certainly not going to find him in the dead things that the world convinces us to pursue if we really want life. You know, pursue more money, pursue more fun, per pursue more sex, whatever it is. You know, the world tells you, get more of this, and then you'll be happy. Then you'll be fulfilled. Then you'll be complete. And those are all just dead things. They're temporary things. Jesus isn't there, right? You'll never find him there. Peter, some of you know the story. He's the disciple who actually walked on water. He was a commercial fisherman, and, and one night they were crossing the Sea of Galilee with some other disciples in the boat, and Jesus came walking across the water. And, and Peter said, Lord, if that's you, tell me to come to you. Now, if I'd have been Peter, I, I would have said, Lord, if that's really you, come on, get in the boat. <laughs> you know, I mean, who says, tell me to walk out there to you, right? But Peter said that, and he had faith enough to walk on the water, and then his faith faltered, and he started to sink. But you know, he had the wisdom to do one thing. He had the wisdom to stretch out his hand. So you reach for Jesus, he'll rescue you every time. If you reach for him, he'll rescue you every time. Well, that Peter, he's the same one who denied Christ three times. He's the same guy who, after the resurrection, was so excited to see Jesus standing along the shore that he wouldn't wait for his buddies to row the boat in. He jumped off the edge of the boat and he swam to shore because he couldn't wait to be with Jesus. Now that very Peter wrote this in 2 Peter 1.16. For we did not follow cleverly invented stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. This isn't a, some kind of story. This isn't like all of those other religions where some guy invents something and gets a bunch of followers. And all of those people, by the way, when you look back and you read the records, it's always some of the same things that they're, you know, it's money, sex, and power, you know, whatever they're pursuing, whatever they're after, you never find that here. Because what you find is historical events. And we, got, we, we have ancient documents going all the way back uh, to the second and third century. We've got parts of Scripture going back to the first century. Lots of them, by the way. But we have records going back documenting this, Peter, and these letters. All the way back. This isn't something that somebody sat around and made up. We didn't follow cleverly invented stories. He said we were eyewitnesses. And we celebrate Easter because Jesus walked out of the grave and began immediately to show himself to eyewitnesses. Matthew 28, verse 8. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. 
go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. In fact, there are at least 12 or, or 13 different appearances of Christ in the 40 days after he rose from the dead. Paul wrote about some of them in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 8. He said, for what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance. He said, pay attention to this, primary importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter, and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Now, let me tell you something. If you're inventing something that is false, you don't write the account and say, you don't have to take my word for it. Go to Jerusalem. There's hundreds of people still alive who saw it. You never write that. Most of whom are still living. Though some have fallen asleep, that's a beautiful thing because if you're a follower of Jesus, you never die. You just fall asleep here and you wake up there. Some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as to one born after he was due, after the due date. Paul said, that's me later. I came later because he wasn't one of the original apostles. In fact, his name was Saul, and he hated Christians, and he persecuted them. He traveled with arrest warrants and had them arrested, and then he cast his vote to put them to death if they would not deny their faith. That was his life before he met Jesus. Then when he met Jesus, everything changed, and he became one of the greatest missionaries and preachers in the history of the church, all right? One of the greatest. Um, you know, this is all true. You think of the times when the lives of the men and women who followed Jesus were shaken. Their lives were shaken the day they met him. You know, the, the disciples, you know, come follow me. They left everything and they followed him. They didn't know where they were going. They didn't know how long they were going for. They didn't know where they'd sleep. They didn't know what they'd eat. They didn't know what they'd wear. They didn't have answers to anything, but they followed him because their life was so shaken in that single encounter with Jesus. Something resonated inside them. They said, I know it's true. I know it's true. I know. And they just had to follow and then, of course, almost 2,000 years ago, it was a Friday, and even though Jesus told them it was going to happen, their lives were shaken at the cross, watching their Savior, the one that they knew was the Son of God, watching him die. How is that possible? And then Sunday morning, at the tomb, their lives were shaken again because the tomb was empty. Jesus was alive. You know, Jesus told the truth. 69 times in the Gospels I counted that Jesus began speaking by saying, I tell you the truth, because the world will tell you all kinds of things, and a lot of them sound good. Boy, measure it against what he has to say, because he said, I tell you the truth. I tell you the truth. The one who loves you, the one who cares for you more than any other person ever can will tell you the truth. I tell you the truth. And he told us that heaven and hell are real. And he told us that essentially we're going to be choosing our destiny. Because Jesus died on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins, the innocent paying for the guilty, those who choose by faith to seek forgiveness for their sins, who by faith receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior, those people spend eternity in heaven. In fact, he said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I'm coming back to get you, to take you to be with me where I am. Everyone else, though, those who have no interest in Christ, boy, I was a part of this for years and years and years. Jesus was clear. Even though it breaks the heart of God, it, it, though it defies reason to reject his gift, those who have no interest in Christ will follow Satan and his demons to hell. How about you? Where do you stand this morning? For years, I was hanging by a thread, and I didn't even know it. I mean, all I cared about for years was baseball and playing baseball. I was one of those kids who slept with my glove. You think I got over that? Oh, no. High school, still sleeping with my glove. And yet I was hanging by a thread and didn't even know it one heartbeat away from an eternity of suffering apart from Christ. I mean, there was a church on every corner. 
I'm sure there must have been a Bible in my house. I couldn't have told you where it was. And then, as a teenager, starting to connive and scheme different ways to sin without getting caught, as though the Lord couldn't see it, right? But since God didn't make any difference to me, that didn't matter. And then I got older, abusing alcohol to the point that one night I was driving on a sidewalk and my life was hanging by a thread and I didn't even know it. Sitting in college classes and my life was hanging by a thread, one heartbeat away, and I didn't know it. I was living on the wrong path. Now, here's the thing about the wrong path. It's not always unpleasant. In fact, there can be a lot of pleasure on the wrong path. And there can be good friends on the wrong path. There can be a lot of family members on the wrong path. There can be a nice job on the wrong path. There can be all kinds of things. The problem with the wrong path isn't that it seems wrong. The Bible says there is a way that seems right to a man. The problem is it seems right. And he says, but in the end, it leads to death. And that's where I was. I was walking on that path. And then I came to a fork in the road, a place of decision. How did I get there? Well, this guy who um, I, I thought at the time was very socially awkward, that, uh, you know, I was way too cool to run with this guy, and he invited me to a Bible study, which is what I, in my mind, thought only socially awkward people would do. <laughs> because I'd never been to a Bible study, and I didn't know anybody who'd ever been to a Bible study. I didn't intend to go. I was thinking in my mind, honestly, I'm not, I was thinking, is this the Moonies? Who does this? Because I thought I was a Christian. I knew we didn't study the Bible. So I was thinking how to politely tell him no when he said those words that changed my life. He said, there will be a lot of girls there. <laughs> See, that's the interesting thing because, you, you know, even there, I was still walking on the wrong path, but, you know, God was steering me. He knew what he was doing. He was bringing me. I was on the wrong path, but God was leading me to a fork in the road. He was leading me. Even though I was on the wrong path and going for the wrong reason, he was bringing me to that place. And I walk into this Bible study, and it was young single adults between the ages of about 19 and 25, 26, 7 years old, somewhere in there. About 50 of them in the room. And they were worshiping like we were worshiping this morning. And I was blown away. I had never experienced anything like it. And I remember thinking, whatever it means to be a Christian, it clearly means something different to these people than it's ever meant to me. And I thought, I better listen. I better listen when this guy gets some talk. He was a young guy. There wasn't any adults. There wasn't pastors leading the place. I mean, they, they were young adults, everybody. But uh, just one of the young guys got up and began to share the simple truth that brought me right exactly to that fork in the road. On the one path, the gospel says there's surrender and faith, but it's followed by joy, and it's followed by eternal life, a new heaven, by the way, and a new earth, along with a place in God's house designed especially, specifically for you, a place of beauty and wonder and meaningful work and perfect relationships. That's heaven, by the way. And then on the other path... It was like, well, Brad Root, continue to pursue whatever you think is going to make you happy, even though you're wrong, but pursue it anyway. And when you die, you pay the penalty for your own sins. That's the choice that we get to make. You either allow him to pay, or you pay the penalty for your own and I'll tell you, you'll pay the penalty for those sins in hell where you belong if you reject so great a gift. That was where I stood. 
I, I've described it sometimes. I heard that gospel message and, and uh, right away, something in me just resonated. I knew that it was true. I couldn't believe that I'd been in church, you, you know, for so much of my growing up years and had never heard this. I knew that it was true. A part of me was angry because I'm thinking, what about my family? What about all these people that I love? And, and I heard this voice inside my head very clearly say, that's, not, that, that's the wrong question. The question isn't what about them. The question is, is it true? And when I was a little kid in my town, we had a, a public swimming pool, and it cost a dime uh, to go, and they had a high diving board, and it was high. Let me tell you, it was a high, high diving board. And I remember walking out on it, scary enough just walking out on it, you know, and they flex when you're walking on them. And it wasn't like a platform like they dive off where you walk out this. No, no, this is like this. And I remember standing at the end of that diving board with my toes dangling, you know what? When, when you stand right there, you're in a place of decision. Countless times I saw somebody from right there slowly back up two steps, <laughs> get down on their knees, spin around, <laughs> crawl back to the ladder, and crawl down. See, a lot of people are like that when they come up to Jesus because it's costly. It's going to cost you something. You, and you know it. You see it. Oh, man, we're living together. I'm not going to be able to continue living together like this. Man, I'm out partying all. I'm not going to be able to do that. If I, you, you know what? My, man, I'm going to have to clean. I'm going to have to change something. You, you know, we see it, and it's true. There are some things that God says, ah, 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 that's on the wrong path. That's on the path that leads to death. That's not the path I have for you. And a lot of people, man, they, they get to the, to the place. And they go back. They turn off. But I knew that it was true. And I jumped. And that's why I prayed to receive Christ. And there are people who knew me as a teenager, people who knew me as a college student, people who knew me as a young man in the army, who even today will say, you a pastor? Now, they say, I know who you really are. And I say, no, you know who I really was. That's not who I am. Because the word of God says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. And while it's true that before I got saved, I wounded some people in ways that I can't fix. I can't fix it. I can't fix it. That might be true for you as well. Or maybe somebody wounded you in a way that can't be fixed. But I also know that when I became new, Christ forgave all of that. And if I were to write all of those things down and make my list and turn it around so God could read it and he would read the first thing on the list... And he'd say, no, I don't remember that. And he'd read the next thing and he'd say, no, I don't remember that. And he'd read the next thing and say, no, I don't, rem I don't remember any of this. You see, because the blood of Jesus washed it away. And God doesn't see it. When he looks at me, he sees a forgiven child of God. Now, there are a lot of people in the world who think, that they get a free pass to heaven because they say, well, I believe in God. Maybe you're one of them. I used to be just like this. Like that's the moral equivalency uh, test. Well, I believe in God. You know, like I'm just like you. I just believe differently than you. Imagine, imagine um, a criminal in jail and has not yet come to trial but is guilty Knows he's guilty, not plead, he's pleading guilty. He just hasn't come to trial yet. And then he says to the jailer one day, you know, I believe in judges. So naturally, the jailer opens the door and lets him free, right? Because he believes in the judge. I mean, he's sincere. He really does. He believes in the judge. So they let him go, right? I mean, that would be silly. 
But people apply that same logic to God. He's a righteous judge. And if you stood before him today, accused of having broken just one of his commandments, let's say telling a lie. Is there anyone here who's never told a lie? I mean, if you raise your hand, you just told another one. <laughs> right? But if you stood before him accused of just breaking that one, you've given him no choice. Because he always tells the truth. And you're guilty. And if I stood before him and he, going down some of the other of the Ten Commandments, Brad Rude, you ever use my name to curse? Yes, Lord. Guilty. You always honor your parents? No, Lord. Guilty. You ever take anything that didn't belong to you? Yes, Lord. Guilty. Guys, I'm just getting started. Now, the only question is, who is going to pay the penalty for my sins? Because clearly I'm guilty, and I can't ask God to lie. Sure, you believe in the judge. That's not the question. The question is, are you innocent or guilty? And you all know the answer. So the question is, who will pay? Those who hear this good news and walk away from Christ, do you know what the Bible calls that? Trampling upon the blood of Jesus. You can trample. You can smirk. You can say that's for somebody else. But I pray that that thread that you are hanging by doesn't break until you have an opportunity to reconsider. Because we're all just one heartbeat away. I know that Jesus is the Son of God. I asked Him to forgive me and to save me. Now when I stand before Him accused by, by Satan of all those things, Satan will come, Satan will come. He'll say, no, no, He belongs to me. He did this and this and this and this and this and Jesus will stand between me and God the Father and say, no, 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 He belongs to me. My blood paid for His sins. That's what He wants to do for every single one of us in this room, for every single person in Alaska, in America, around the globe. It's why he came, for God so loved the world that he gave us, his one and only son, to save us. But friends, you come not simply believing in God. God says he's so evident in all of creation that, that we're without excuse. He says, of course you believe in me. You see the resurrection story everywhere. You take a seed, you take it to all of the top schools of science, the universities all over America, and they all examine the seed, and they will all tell you the same thing. It's dead. There's no life in it. Of course, they don't like the fact that something dead raises to life, so now they don't have the integrity to call it dead anymore. They call it non-living viable, which of course means dead, but something's going to happen. That's what it means, dead but bury it and something new and beautiful will be raised to life. Guys, God is evident. Yes, you believe in Him. Of course you do. You have to be taught to not believe in God. That's not the question. The question is, are you innocent or guilty? And if you're guilty, who's going to pay the penalty for your sins? Jesus said, I, I am willing. I am willing. So how? How does that happen? It happens when by faith, when you really do believe and you choose by faith, I do believe that he's the, the Savior. I believe that he told the truth. When by faith you come to Jesus confessing what you and God already know. Listen, I'm a sinner. Jesus, I know that I'm guilty. Please forgive me. When you come by faith confessing him as your Lord and Savior, the promise of God is that this amazing spiritual transaction will take place. And the old you before Christ will be dead and gone. And the new you will be born. That's why Jesus said, you must be born again. You will, you, you will experience immediately, today yet, the Holy Spirit of God taking up residence inside your body. And he'll start changing the way you think and the way you act. Because why? Because you'll start seeing things clearly. You'll, you'll start to think according to what is true and real and right. It's a beautiful transaction, and it's why we're here today. 
The Bible says that the Spirit, that's the Spirit of God, says, come, come, come. But it also says that the bride, which is the church, the bride of Jesus, the Spirit and the bride, the church says, come, come. Take from the free gift of the water of life. If that's you, we want to give you that opportunity right now, right where we're sitting. If you believe that he's the Messiah, you ask him to forgive you and to save you right now. And the promise of God is that he will adopt you in this moment to be a son or a daughter of God for eternity. This is your decision. Let's pray. We'll all bow and pray with you. Pray this simple prayer of faith right where you're seated. You can say this out loud or you can say it softly, your heart to his. Jesus, I do believe you're the son of God. I believe that you died on a cross to pay for my sins and the sins of the whole world. And I believe you rose again. I confess to you that I'm a sinner. I've said and thought and done so many things that are wrong. I know that I'm guilty. And I'm asking you, please forgive me. And right now, Jesus, by faith, because you promised I am receiving the gift of forgiveness and eternal life. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for adopting me to be a child of God. Show me now from this moment forward how to live in a way that pleases you. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.